let me ask you a question. When it comes to knowing if there is a God and what God is like, does it really come down to the Bible tells me so? I want you to think about that. Is that really what it comes down to? Does it come down to the Bible tells me so? Because we're living in a time, we're living in a culture where people are deconstructing their faith. It's kind of a, a new term that's being used, the deconstruction of people's faith. And, and what that means is people are, are, are looking at their faith, and they're looking at what they were taught, and they're looking at the church, and they're looking at Christianity, and they're looking at what they grew up on, and they're deconstructing it. They're taking it apart, and they're looking at all the pieces of it. And some people, for that reason, are, are, are leaving their faith, abandoning their faith, walking away from their faith. And, and two of the biggest issues, when I, when I talk to people or when I step into these conversations or these arenas and I listen to what's going on, there's two things that are usually people's hang-ups when it comes to their faith. And that's this, that it comes down to the Bible and the hypocrisy of the church. Now, the latter we're going to talk about after this series. We're going to do a six-week series called Finding Jesus. It's going to take us through May. And then in June, we're going to do a series on the hypocrisy of the church. And I promise you, you do not want to miss it because it is going to be really, really good. But when it comes to the Bible, what, what, who is God? Is it real? Is it true? And, and, and people have hang-ups. People are deconstructing their faith. And, and, and here, here's a question for you. I mean, if, if the Christian faith balances precariously on the edge of ancient declarations of superstitious men, why not? A couple years ago, I really wanted to understand atheism so I could better you know, reach and communicate and be pastor to somebody who was dealing with that, who had an, an atheist perspective or who claimed to be atheist. And so I went really deep into atheism and tried to, to study that and understand that. And I remember there was a, an, an actor who I really enjoyed who had a podcast, who has a podcast, um, Dax Shepard. Um, he has a, a top 20 podcast called Armchair Expert. And he talked about this one day. I had no clue that Dax was an atheist, but he said, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, putting this together off of memory because I couldn't find the exact quote. But basically what he said is he, he was talking about Christians and he's like, are you telling me you believe what you believe based on 66 ancient documents that were all written by men that didn't know each other in a time where people were superstitious and believed in, in gods uh, and had no sense of modern science at all? And if that's what we believe, if, if Christian faith balances precariously on the edge of these ancient documents written by superstitious men during a time period where there was no modern science, why not? I mean, why not walk away from their faith? No, no, no joke that they're, they're deconstructing that they're, their faith and they're having a hard time with this. I mean, isn't that kind of, uh, you know, make sense? I mean, let me, let me make it a little bit more personal for you. Are you really surprised? Are you really surprised that your son, that your daughter, that your grandchild, that your neighbor is deconstructing their faith? If what we believe really does just teeter on the edge of uh, these ancient documents written in a time where people didn't know each other by superstitious men, where there was no science, I mean, are we surprised? Or let me make it even more personal for you. Should we really be surprised that you, that you are struggling with your faith? That you are deconstructing your faith? Because that, isn't that true? Isn't it true that in some, nobody else may know this in the room, but you personally, you, you, your spouse may believe, your parents may believe, your family may believe, but you have had so many hang-ups. And as you've gotten older and as you've become more educated and as you've researched the Bible and where the Bible came from and, and, and how the Bible was all put together, isn't it true that you yourself are deconstructing your faith and that nobody in this room may even know, but you may even have your hand on the doorknob? ready to leave. And the truth is, is that you don't want to leave the church. You love the church. You love your friends at the church. But when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the hypocrisy of the church, which is being publicized and seen and talked about in podcasts and TV shows and things have been discovered about megachurches that we've, we've all looked up to and followed for decades now. I mean, is it really a surprise that this generation is deconstructing their faith and on the edge of leaving the church shouldn't surprise you at all. 
doesn't surprise me at all. But here's the thing. Does Christianity rise and fall on the accuracy and the inerrancy of 66 ancient documents? And the answer is no. Christianity does not rise and fall on the accuracy or the inerrancy of 66 ancient documents. And look, I get it. For some of you, that's what you grew up on. That's what I grew up on. And for some of you, that's enough. But you know this already. For, for some of you, this is not enough for your son. This is not enough for your daughter. This is not enough for your grandchild. This is not enough for your neighbor. This is not enough for your spouse. That just isn't enough. And the good news is that it shouldn't be expected of you. The good news is that Christianity does not rise and fall on the accuracy or the inerrancy of 66 ancient documents. The good news is this, is that Christianity rises and falls on an individual, Jesus. I said this last week. If you were here for our Easter message, I said this, that our faith, our faith, the foundation of our faith is built on a event. It is built on Jesus Without Jesus, without the cross, and more specifically and most importantly, without the resurrection, you never get the Bible. The, the, the event doesn't exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of the event. Without Jesus, you wouldn't even have the Old Testament because I think I know you all pretty well. You're all Gentiles, okay? I don't think any of you are the descendants of Abraham. Maybe one or two, but I don't think anybody here is a descendant of Abraham. So guess what? Without Jesus, you wouldn't even have the Old Testament. You wouldn't even have the Jewish law in your hands without Jesus. Christianity does not rise and fall on the Bible. Christianity rises and falls on Jesus. And so when we start to talk about scripture and the bible and when we try to figure out who god is and what god is like and if it is true the question we shouldn't ask ourselves is is god real or why god this or or is this true that those are all off ramps to faith the question that we should really be struggling with that we should really be investigating and looking through is this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or John, not and John, or John, a reliable account of actual events? It's not, is, is the Bible true? Is the Bible real? If that is our debate, we will lose it. But is, it, is, is Matthew, is Mark, is Luke, or John, are they reliable accounts of actual events? Are any one of them, it doesn't even have to be all four, is any one of them telling the truth about who Jesus is and what Jesus did? Because if any one is, 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 is accurate, game on then it should cause us to lean in and to investigate and to ask questions and to discover. Because if any single one of them are telling the truth about who Jesus is, then we should pay attention. Then we should lean in. Then should, we should be curious. Then that is a reason to not leave the faith. You can deconstruct your faith and you can deconstruct the church, but if any one of them are telling the truth about who Jesus is, then we have a reason to hang on and to investigate. So what we're going to do for the next six weeks is we're going to look at just one of those accounts. We've, we've done this before. We've looked at different Gospels, and so I've never done this one before. So we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke. Now, you may not know this, okay? And that's okay if you don't know this, all right? But Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, not all, those are not all part of the 12. Sometimes whenever people are like, can you name the 12 apostles? You're like, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You're like, Actually, no. Only two of those uh, were actual apostles. So Mark was not an apostle of Jesus. He was not part of the 12, and neither was Luke. So, well, then why should we listen to Luke at all? Well, Luke was a doctor, apparently, and Luke knew Peter. He knew John. He knew James, and he, he knew all these people. He traveled with these people. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts, which comes up later, right? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Luke wrote the book of Acts as well. And so Luke 
investigates and writes this account for us. And his account is different than any other because he wasn't an apostle, but because he knew the apostles. And, and his gospel starts differently than anybody else's. When you read the very first words of Luke, uh, what he says is so important. I think sometimes if you've ever read it, you probably skip, skip over it and you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. But there's something so important here to unpack in just the first few verses of the Gospel of Luke. So the very first word, the very first word of the Gospel of Luke is this. Many. Many. How many is many? I ain't one. Not two. I don't know about you, but not, not three or four, right? Many. Many is a lot, right? Depends on who you are and what you're talking about. But, but, but many is more than, more than a couple, right? More than a few. Many. He says many. Then he goes on. He says this. He says many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. This is so, so very important. It's something you have to understand. There's context here and there's history here. He says, many, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, the things that have happened among us. Now, why is this important? Because for some people, this is a hang-up. But the truth is, is that there are many, many people who try to draw up an account of Jesus' life here on earth. He says, I'm not the only one. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not silly. I, I know there's other people who have tried to draw up an account. I know there's other people who have attempted this, who are doing this. Many, many people. But let me ask you a question, okay? At the end of your life, how many people do you think are going to take time to draw up an account of your life? How many people do you think are going to write a book about you or a letter about you? How many people do you think in this modern time where, you know, technology is so accessible, how many people do you think are going to stop to draw up an account of your life? I'll give you the answer. It's okay. Not many. <laughs> Not many. Not many people are going to stop to draw up an account of your life. If you're lucky... My daughter will write a Facebook post about me one day, if that's even a thing then, all right? I mean, not many. I mean, when you're gone, you're going to be gone. Maybe people tell stories, but let's be honest, they're probably going to be making fun of you for something stupid you did, right? So not many, not many, even today in modern day, not many, not many people are going to stop to draw up an account of your life. Now, putting it in context of that time, do you know how many people had their life, an, an account drawn up their life? Not many. Even some of the most famous people. Tiberius Caesar was the Caesar at that time. A really well-known uh, uh, emperor of that time. He, he, nobody drew up an account of his life. We have hardly anything, no history, no anything on Tiberius Caesar. Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a terrific architect, did so much uh, architectural and, and building uh, projects during that time. Guess how many accounts we have on him? Zero. Pilate. Pilate during that time. You see Pilate in the story of Jesus, but do you know how many accounts were drawn up of Pilate? He was very famous. He was very rich. Guess how many accounts? Zero. Zero. For some reason, for some reason, we have not one, not two, but many accounts of a 30-year-old peasant day laborer from Galilee. Why? Why? Why in the world would anybody, not one, not two, but many, stop to draw up an account of a 30-year-old peasant day laborer's life? You know why? The only explanation is because something extraordinary happened. That's the only explanation. Why would, why would anybody, but why would many, why would many go through the tedious, expensive process of drawing up an account of somebody's life unless something extraordinary happened, something so big, so game-changing happened that somebody said, this has to be shared, this has to be copied, this has to be preserved, and it needs to be passed on because it's extraordinary. And not only was it something extraordinary, but something good happened. 
Something good happened, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles. Not for Galilee or Judea, but for the world. Something extraordinary happened and something good happened. And it was so extraordinary and it was so good that it needed to be taken account for and then it needed to be shared. Why? Why do we even have this? Because something extraordinary happened. Because something good happened. And then Luke goes on and he says this. He says, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And again, the word, sometimes when you see the word in the New Testament, it's like, oh, see, they're already talking about the Bible. No, there was no Bible. Nor was there ever any intention of creating a the Bible. When he talks about the word, he's talking about Jesus. So when you see that in your New Testament scriptures, like, well, right there, it says the word. Not talking about the Bible. We're talking about Jesus. And so what Luke says, he goes, I have all this and we have all this. We have this information because they were given to us by eyewitnesses. We have, we have, we have stories. We have direct quotes. We have, we have travel, travel itinerary. We know where this person went. We know what they said, and we know the illustrations and the lessons that they gave. We have it all because there were people who were there. There were people who were there that remembered it, that it meant something to, to them, and they told me the stories. I have been so careful to look through this, and I've been given firsthand accounts of what was said and what was done and what was shared. And he says this, he says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Luke says, look, I want you to understand, I've done my due diligence. I have carefully investigated. And to show you how carefully I've investigated, I've started from the very beginning. The unique thing about the gospel of Luke that not all the gospels do is it starts with the birth narrative. It tells us about John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. I mean, he says, I want you to know how carefully I've investigated this. I'm not even just talking about the years between 30 and 33 where Jesus did all that he did and said all he said. I want to take you back from the very beginning because even at the very beginning, there are details and there are stories and there are family and there are people and, and there are eyewitnesses there. And it's extraordinary what happened. It is good what happened. And I've, I've come to share that with you. Then he says this. He says, and I too, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Now, here's what I need you to understand about Luke and about the gospel of Luke. When Luke sat down to write an account, he was not writing the Bible. Okay? There was never a point in history or time where a bunch of church leaders got together and they said, well... It's time for us to create a document that everybody can hold sacred and holy, just like the Torah. So we're going to need to write a book, okay? You take Matthew, because your name's Matthew. You take Mark, because your name's Mark. I'm Luke, so I'll take Luke. John, you do John. Peter, you're going to need to do two of them, okay? And Paul, I don't know, you just write the rest. You know what I mean? Like, there was never a meeting of minds where this took place or where this happened. What happened was, is there was a person. There was a person who requested an account for this story. And so Luke decides to write an account for this one person, for this you. He never knew that it would be copied. He never knew that it would be taken and it would be read and it would be meticulously copied and then it would be shared and it would be passed on to to many different people across the world. He had no clue that 2,000 years later we would be sitting inside of a church and that we would be talking about this letter that Luke wrote. He had no idea that this is what would happen. He had no intention of that. So the question you have to ask yourself is like, when you look at the gospel of Luke, when you look at Luke and what he wrote and what he said about Jesus, the question is not, is the Bible true or is the Bible real? The question you need to ask yourself is this, is Luke lying? Is Luke lying? Is he lying? he lying? Because some people think, well, the the Bible is just a made-up document to be able to, you know, brainwash people and take control. Well, no, there was no meeting of minds for that. And if there was a meeting of minds for that, what was their end goal? Okay? If Luke is making all this up and trying to, you know, get people to, to follow this and to take this on, there's no benefit to it. 
the, during the time where Luke writes this, there is no church, okay? There's nowhere to send your tithes and offerings. There's no online giving, okay? So he's not trying to raise money. He doesn't have a podcast or a YouTube show. He doesn't have a book to promote. He has nothing to garner from this. He's not trying to draw in members to some big building or mega church or anything like that. He's not hosting an Easter service or anything like that. Luke has nothing to gain from this. As a matter of fact, doing this, Luke puts a, a target on his back because all the men who are trying to draw up an account of this and to protect this are dying, are being killed because during this time the emperor is persecuting Christians. So if you think that Luke has some kind of huge goal in mind other than than to share what eyewitnesses have actually seen, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears to, to listen what it is, what the conspiracy theory is. Because there's nothing for Luke to gain from lying. If he was lying, I would have made a lot more sunshines and rainbows and promises other than our Savior came to die on a cross and he was alive again three days later. So is Luke lying? Because if he's not then there's something there to pay attention to. And Luke, Luke tells us, he says this next. He says, I too have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent philosopher, uh, Theophilus. Theophilus. I'm sorry, I got tongue-tied there for a second. Theophilus. Okay? Who is Theophilus? Well, obviously he was a believer, and he was a rich believer. Because, I mean, for somebody to draw up a singular account just for you, you had to have some money there, right? I mean, there had to be something there. And so he's saying, I'm writing this account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And, and he, he tells us why. Why? Why is he writing this? Luke says this. He says, I'm writing this to you so that you may know for certainty of the things you have been taught. John says something so similar to this, and I think this is such an important lesson for Christians to learn. John, when he starts his gospel, he says, I have written this down for you so that you may believe. If you look at the gospel of Luke and you look at the gospel of John, there is no conspiracy theory, and there also is no, well, you just got to have faith, brother. Anybody grew up in a church like that? I have questions. I have questions. I have doubts. I'm struggling with something. Well, you just got to have faith, brother. Let me tell you something. The answer is never to just have faith, brother, okay? Luke wrote this down, and he says, I am writing these, this down. Theophilus was a believer. He was a Christian. He, he believed what he had heard by, by just stories. But when, he, when he heard about Jesus, he believed. He put his faith in Jesus. But Luke comes underneath, and he goes, look, I think it's awesome that you believe, and I think it's awesome that you follow Jesus, but let me just come up behind you, and let me give you some foundation. Let me tell you the stories. Let me give you the illustrations. Let me give you the details, because when you have the details, and you have the story, it gives you some foundation to put under this faith that you've put in your Lord and Savior. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of proof. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of evidence. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of investigation. And all of these first-hand accounts of these Gospels, they all tell us that. We have given you this so that you may know for certainty but I thought you just got a half faith, brother. No, I've given you this so that you may know for certainty that the things you have been taught are true. They are real. I am not lying to you. I have nothing to gain from lying to you. Luke was trying to connect the dots. Luke was trying to connect that there was an event with Jesus that led to a movement that would eventually lead to the Bible. And what we have to be careful of as Christians is that we don't start with the Bible to try to get people to move. We don't need to. We don't have to tell people to just take it from faith, brother. There's evidence there, and there are stories, and it was those stories, sometimes just having a singular gospel, that led to the movement. Some of you may or may not know this, but... During this time, as these first-hand accounts are, are, are being written, people start to meticulously copy them. They start to be shared. Sometimes people would just even get one. They'd have it for a short time before they'd pass it on, and they would memorize it. And then they would share it with somebody else. And then at the end of the, uh, the third century, the beginning of the fourth century, 
Diocletian, the last emperor to persecute Christians. Diocletian, he, he thought that the gods were angry because the Christians ha- had ceased to, to, uh, to offer sacrifices to the gods. So, so by this time, uh, the, there is no temple. The Christians are, are not making sacrifices. And Diocletian says, it's the Christians' fault, so we need to take out the Christians. So what does Diocletian do? Number one, he arrests and takes up all the bishops. Then he takes all the home churches, all the ecclesias, the home churches that are meeting, and he shuts them down. But then the thing that he was really driven to do was he needed to burn their literature. These letters, these firsthand accounts that were circulating around, they had to be collected and they had to be burned. So before... Between this time, as Diocletian um, is emperor from about uh, 284 A.D. to about 305 A.D., he's he's persecuting Christians, and people are literally risking their lives. They have this copy of Luke's gospel. They have this copy of Mark's gospel. They have a copy of this firsthand account from John, and they are protecting it with their lives. Some of these Christians dying for this. Why? Because it contained something extraordinary. Because it contained something extraordinary. Good. And then Constantine becomes the new emperor. And guess what? Constantine's mother was a Christian. And so Constantine ends the persecution of Christians. Makes, makes, allows the Christians to come back out. So then what happens is, is all these bishops, all these bishops start to come out of hiding and come out and they're, they're let out of prison. And they have, they have these letters, they have these firsthand accounts. And for the first time in human history, they are legally able to get together and to share everything that they have. So some guy goes, I have something written by Luke. The guy says, well, I, I have a letter written from John. I have a letter written from Mark. I have Matthew's account here. And so these, for the first time, began to bring bring all of these different ancient documents that had been in circulation for up to the past 50 years and they start to put them together and they start to compare them and look at the context and see what is similar and what is not. Now, you may or may not know this. Yes, people bring this up all the time. Guess what? There are ancient documents and there are quote-unquote lost gospels that are not in your New Testament Bible. They are not in your Bible that you open up. And some people get hung up on that. They go, well, you know there's ancient documents that were written that aren't even in there, right? I mean, that's kind of sketchy, right? I mean, what's up with that? But the thing is, is I invite you to read them. You can look them up on the Internet. I read one last night. And here's the thing. You can go read those openly, and guess what you'll probably find? You'll probably find what I found and what the bishops found during that time is that when you start to look at them, the context doesn't match up with the context of what we have in our Bible now, in our New Testament Bible. These stories don't even match up. I mean, you've got ones where Paul has a talking pet lion. There's man-eating seals. There's one lost gospel that tells us about what Jesus was like as a kid. And one time he got mad and he shot fireballs out of his eyes, okay? If you are hung up on the Bible because there's ancient documents that you are missing and you think maybe should belong in there, I invite you to read them and you'll come to the same conclusion as I was. Somebody was high when they wrote this because it's a trip, okay? So go ahead, go ahead and look at that. But for the first time, these bishops come together and they compare it and they go, oh my goodness, this is, exa- this is like what Mark said. This is, or this is more details. Or, oh, this is the birth narrative. This is, Paul had a talking pet lion. Yeah, burn that, okay? Uh, go, go this. And then for the first time, they bound together these stories. And what's so amazing is that Constantine ordered 50 copies of the very first Bible because he wanted the bishops to all have the top 50 bishops of the empire. He wanted them all to have the same documents to be able to teach the same things and all have the same tools and be on the same page. And so the government, the same empire that killed Jesus, ended up financing the first 50 copies of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? But when you learn about how the Bible was put together, what you realize is it's not about the Bible tells me so. It's about that Jesus, Jesus is the story. Jesus is the story. And the thing is, is that if Jesus is the story, then it is worth looking into. So, if you are deconstructing your faith, if you 
are on the fence. If you are struggling with, I don't know if God is real, I don't know if the Bible is true, and there is so much hypocrisy of the church that I don't know if I could ever give the church a second chance. Here's a couple things I want to say to that. The first thing is this, and this is going in my book one day when I write it. Um, I think you'll like this. Okay, here's the thing. We've all had bad guacamole. Amen? Right? Can I get an amen? I'll say it again. It's cool. We've all had bad guacamole. Okay, now here's the thing, all right? We've all had bad guacamole. I've had bad guacamole. You've had bad guacamole. It didn't stop me from continuing to eat guacamole. I love guacamole. When guacamole is good, I love guacamole. When guacamole is bad, I go, "Eh, I'll try it again, though. Here's the thing. For some of you, for some of you, you've said, I had a bad church experience, and I'm done with the church. But here's the thing when it comes to that. We've all had bad church experiences. I grew up in church. My dad's a pastor. I got more than you have. Okay? We've all had bad church experiences, but that should not cause us to give up on the church. And I know that some Christians say, well, you don't have to have church to be a Christian. And I would tell you, I strongly disagree with that. Because when Jesus turned to Peter and he said, I'm going to build my church, I'm going to build my ecclesia on you. And then if you look at half the things that Jesus did with and among those disciples, you can't even fulfill half of those without a group of people who are gathered together to worship and learn about Jesus. You can't be Christian without an ecclesia. And you say to yourself, well, I don't need that big church, so I'm just going to get a couple of my friends together, and we're going to worship God, and we're going to pray, and we're going to learn about Jesus. I hate to tell you, you just planted a church. (laughs) It's called a home church, okay? The answer is to not get rid of the church. The answer is to not throw away the church. We've We've all had bad guacamole. We've all had bad church experience. There's no reason to give up or to walk away from the church. It's either to do what I did and to plant your own church or, or, or to, find a, to find a better one. So, with that said, there is only one reason for you to not follow Jesus, and it's this. If you choose not to follow Jesus because it's inconvenient. It, look, here's the thing. If you choose to follow Jesus, it will require something of you. It will cost you. You are agreeing to be at the end of the line. You are agreeing to be a servant first. You are willing to put yourself aside and to put others before you. You are, you are signing up to forgive people who do unforgivable things. You are signing up to love your enemy, to love your neighbor. You, you are signing up to, to, to be generous and to give. And I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you, if you agree to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. It's just like that worship songs. Till we get to the point where we just can't take anymore, and we are just plumb exhausted, and we feel like we've given everything that we can give. Yay, Jesus. Yay, God. That is what you are signing up for. So if you choose not to follow Jesus because it's inconvenient for you, I get it. I empathize with that. I understand. And trust me, there's plenty of people that that's where they land. But let me tell you something. If you follow Jesus, it will make your life better and it will make life fuller. But do not choose not to follow Jesus Don't choose not to follow Jesus because you don't think there's anything to the story of Jesus. Because there is. Because Luke had no reason to lie. Matthew had no reason to lie. Mark had no reason to lie. So, if there's something there, would you lean in? Would you investigate? Would you be willing to at least attempt to find Jesus, and I think that what you will find is something extraordinary. I think that something you will find is something good, good for you, good for your family, good for our community, and good for our country. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we come to you this morning with open hearts. Father God, I know for some of us listening, 
we've deconstructed our faith. We've been on the fence about God. We've had hangups that are things that don't match up or work for us that are in the Bible. And we've been told in the past to just have faith that the Bible says, Father God, this morning, we focus on you. We understand the reason for any of it is because of you. That there are stories there, that there are firsthand accounts of your life, of your commands, of your invitation. So God, would you help us to lean in? Would you, would you help us to investigate? Would you help us, if we've got the door, our, our hand on the door ready to leave our faith, would you help us to, to hang on? Would you, would you help us to stay, stay and to lean and to listen and to learn? And would we find you? Would we find Jesus in the story? And would we find that there is something extraordinary, there is something good, and there is something for me, there is something for my family, there is something for our country, there is something for my neighbor that you have done for me. A message that you want me to receive, a lesson you want me to learn. Would you help me to lean into that and not walk away from it just yet, Lord? In your name we pray. Amen. You stand with us as we continue to worship. God of Jacob, great I am, King of angels, Son of Let the lion roar, hail, hail, lion of Judah, let the lion roar, hail, hail, lion of Judah, let the lion roar, hail, hail, lion of Judah, let the lion roar. Oh, 
Thank you for joining us this week. Have a blessed Sunday. We'll see you back next time.